screen. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. So in recognition of First Peoples uh, and continuing ACS community reconciliation, it is customary to acknowledge country as we pass through. Today, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the First Peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways. We thank them for their continued custodianship. We acknowledge and celebrate the continuation of living culture that has a unique role in this region and on all campuses of Australian Catholic University. We will also acknowledge elders past and present and thank them for their wisdom and guidance as we walk in their footsteps. So I'd like to call upon our Professor John Marshall Reef to introduce today's brown bag presenter. All right, we uh, have a treat from the old country uh, <laughs> for um, Abigail Parrish. She's uh, from uh, University of Sheffield, which is uh, kind of north of London. Well north, uh, if you know Liverpool and um, yeah. whatever city that the Liverpool, yeah, Manchester. Yeah, Manchester. Yeah. Hopefully, Bobstone country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's a uh, let's see, a self, self, partly a self determination theorist, mostly a self determination theorist. Studies language learning and uh, among other things, but uh, especially foreign language education. Uh, working with. Uh, High school students taking elective courses, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so motivation's an issue, she, she finds. Uh, and a lot of these students, according to the articles I saw, have a uh, controlled motivation and they struggle with uh, uh, their engagement and uh, skills and things like that. So I, I don't know if we'll hear some of that, uh, but that's what I picked up as kind of great STT. Uh, and the floor is all yours. And now I do want to say another reason she's here and highly valued is because Don Lee uh, is, uh, was her student, and we got in contact through uh, Don Lee and your friend, and uh, they have a history together, and uh, now we all have a joint history, which we're very grateful for. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll come into Sam's here. Um, there we go. Yes, so it's lovely to be here. I'm tentatively hoping this might be the first of several visits. We'll see, <laughs> see what happens, see if I can find a way of getting back here. I'm very happy to be here uh, today and I'm going to talk about SDT, but knowing my audience, I didn't want to get myself in a position where I was going to get loads of nitty gritty questions about really tricky stat stuff that maybe I'd, you know, <laughs> but I'm going to just skirt some of that. So I'm going to kind of give a bit more of an overview of, of how I use SDT and how or why I use it as well in, in my context. And let's not get too much into, you know, the tricky stuff. Um, so, yes, I, I'm uh, from the UK context. Um, this is my kind of background. So I studied languages um, at university. I trained as a language teacher, PGC is a teacher training qualification. Um, I did a master's in uh, applied professional studies and education. So a teacher's master's, if you like. Um, I did that at the University of Sheffield, where I now work. Um, and in that time, I was also teaching languages. That little logo there, that's the uh, crest of the town where I was working, which is called Grimsby. It's on the east coast of England. There's no reason to go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but unfortunately for the students that I taught there, there's no reason to leave either. It's kind of a, um, it, you know, it's a very deprived area. It's, you know, it's its own little kind of ecosystem. Um, uh, after that, after teaching there a few years, I thought, you know, actually the research that I've done in my master's is much more interesting and fun than the teaching. So I went off to York uh, and did my PhD there. I then worked at uh, Visual Growth Test, which is where I met Dan Ling, um, which is a very tiny university um, in the Midlands of the UK. And I'm now back at Sheffield, uh, where I focus on languages education. And partly because of all of that, uh, what I'm interested in is, as John Marshall said, the students' motivation to learn the language in school. So it's quite kind of specialised. I'm not overly interested in motivation to learning. I'm not overly interested in adults' motivation. And certainly not in my own work, uh, but I'm very happy to read about it. But, um, you know, my, my focus is the, the school kids, really. Um, so I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of introduction to the context that I'm in. Um, I'm going to talk about why, how and why I came to SDT. Um, 
a little bit of some findings, but as you can see, I'm going to kind of, you know, whistle stuff through a few things and kind of, you know, bring it all together a little bit. Um, Ricky has the slides, but also if you have a desperate urge to look at them right this second, um, you can get them from that uh, QR code. Um, OK, so this is the kind of school picture. So I've said MFL, Modern Foreign Languages. That's the name of the school subject. Uh, we could talk about the modern part and the foreign part in there, but that's what it's called. Um, so these are our school years, starting from reception um, all the way to year 13. So that's age 18. You can see, like everywhere, it's split into primary and secondary. We also have this term key stages, which I think is unique to, to England. Um, so in secondary school, we've got key stage three, which is the first three years. Key stage two is two years. Key stage five is two years. And language learning is compulsory at the end of primary school and the first three years, key stage three in secondary school. Um, Beyond that, it becomes optional. And that is that kind of secondary school or, you know, I guess, what would you call it, kind of lower secondary school, maybe, is what people would refer to it as. That's the bit that I'm interested in, really, especially um, the GCSE part. So that GCSE is our exams that they take at age 16. And usually a language is an optional subject, but not always. Um, so there's a whole policy thing going on there about whether or not it's compulsory, and I'll kind of come on to that a little bit more. Um, so that's the kind of picture we're looking at. It's the key stages. It's the terminology that is quite unusual. And this is um, a graph by way of kind of explanation why I'm interested in this, really. Um, these are entries into the different um, GCSE exams over time. So top, top line is French, and um, the orange one is German, the purple one that goes up is Spanish, and then along the bottom is all the other languages. And that's, that's really what we teach. So I know here there's Korean and Japanese and things. We don't have, or we have very little of that going on. Um, and you can see there's been, you know, generally this decline. Spanish has increased because it's become a bit more kind of fashionable. I guess, and kids kind of, so kids and parents say they want it because they go on holiday to Spain. Although if you know anything about Brits in Spain, they don't, they don't speak a lot of Spanish and they don't behave very well generally. Um, but Spanish has become more popular and German, which was my main language at school, has, has dropped right off. Um, so policy, this is kind of the turning point there. And that was when, um, so that's 2004, and that's when languages at a national level switch from being compulsory to optional at GCSE. And you can see immediately what happened. People kind of stopped taking it and carried on not taking it. And um, so that, you know, it's kind of a big deal in, in the language teaching world. And, and people are very hung up on that idea that we should go back to um, uh, compulsory languages, which by now, would be impossible. You know, it would it would take a really long time to, to get back there. Um, but you know, that's that's the kind of picture we're looking at. I'll talk a bit about that kind of bump in the middle, um, I think later on, possibly right now. Um, but that blue line, that's when I started my PhD. And um, so that, you know, in that kind of point in this trajectory. Um, so gonna kind of think a little bit about the attitudes that um you know students often have so this is some qualitative data that i've got i don't like qualitative data very much i like it because it gives you a few you know kind of nice little phrases that you can use but a lot of my colleagues do that kind of build your feelings out of lego draw a nice picture kind of research i don't like um, but i do have some nice quotes and these are i've copied these exactly from what uh, students wrote um on Questionnaire, so you can see it's their language, not mine. Um, so the international language is English. Why do I need it, meaning a foreign language? When I'm not off to a country where they do not speak a language, I do not know. Um, you should not learn other languages because everyone should learn English. 
you know. Um, they're boring in capital letters and we shouldn't have to do them. Everyone should speak English. So, you know, you get you get a sense of what's what's going on here in terms of attitudes. And this one is my favourite. Um, I'm happy speaking my language. Why would I want to learn any other? <laughs> um, so all of this kind of thing. And when I was a teacher, of course, I got this all the time. I got a lot of, you know, why do I need French? I'm not going to travel anywhere. Um, what's the point? Everyone speaks English, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, so that in a way was my my kind of starting point. And I've got, you know, various data um, suggesting that, that those attitudes are ongoing. Um, so I did my PhD at York. As I said, anyone been to the University of York? It's very nice. Has, it has, it's a good, a good fact. Uh, the, the largest plastic bottomed lake in Europe. Um, so if you ever want to see that, you know where to go. You know, it also has this, that's called Central Hall. It's like the main auditorium graduation looks a bit like a spaceship landed in the middle of the lake. Um, so yeah, I was there 2013, 2017. So, um, you know, that was that kind of interesting part in the, um, in the, in the graph that we saw. And by way of how did I get to STT, when I started, I didn't know anything about anything. But, you know, I'd done my master's, but it was, as I said, applied professional studies. It was kind of more about being I'm a teacher. Watching a presentation, what's up? Anything else. Um, so this is kind rotate of how what? it went. Um, uh, my supervisor said to me. You can rotate them. What's your theoretical framework? Um, and I was like. I don't remember. And, and, you know, I just didn't know what she was on about. She kept saying it to me. What is your theoretical framework? What and you know, I knew I wanted something about motivation, but I didn't know anything about motivation. I just knew I wanted to explore it. I had no idea what was going on. Um, eventually, and of course, she didn't say to me, this is what a theoretical framework is. What one are you going to use or anything like that? She just kept saying it and I was stuck. Um, so, you know, I was thinking, well, yeah, OK, I want to know something about motivation. Um, I want to know something about choice because it's kind of optional uh in lots of places and there was work looking at language learning motivation you know i was doing this literature searching but there wasn't really anything in the uk context that was kind of theorized it was you know i've developed this questionnaire and i've asked these questions and that's it this you know this study stands alone um and i wasn't really happy with that and i was getting the feeling from my supervisor that that wasn't going to cut it that wasn't what she wanted to see um so I did you know reading 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 like you do and uh I stumbled across self-determination theory and then you know with some of you at least will be pleased to know everything made sense I was like oh now I know what a, um, a framework is and this works for me I can, I can kind of go with this so that was a really kind of key moment um and, you know, I kind of realised that, okay, so theoretical framework, now there's this whole, like, there's everything there and there's questionnaires and, you know, I can understand where my work might sit in, the, in you know, in a, in a broader field. Um, there was another framework that I eventually kind of realised existed, which if you're language people, you come across, um, called a second language motivational self system. Um, which is uh, Dornier's framework, and there's loads of research that uses this. And I was like, well, maybe I should be using that. That's language learning specific. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it kind of looks like this. So it's ideal self, ought to self, and then something about the learning experience. Um, so that was out there, and people were using it. But I was like, well, actually, when I look at the kind of items that are in there, these don't work. I know the kids I want to work with, and they don't imagine themselves living abroad and having a discussion in English or, well, in English, yes, in, in another language. Um, they can't imagine themselves speaking their language with international friends or colleagues. None of this applies. So all I'm going to do is get a whole load of not true, not true, not true. This isn't going to work. And so even though this is, you know, pretty widely used and has been for a while it just wasn't going to work for me so you know I was like this 
definitely isn't the one. SDC is is what I need. Um, but of course, it's a cult, right? <laughs> like once you're once you're an SDT person, you're not getting away from it. Um, so you know, but that's fine. I'm happy to be in the cult. Like you know, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, and I liked this you know framework that I'd stumbled across because um, it wasn't for the students. It wasn't about the language learning. They weren't driven to do it or not do it because they wanted to learn a language. It was about school, you know, it was about, well, I'm, I'm in school, I've got this on my timetable, you know, I'll, you know, and I'll choose it or I won't choose it and I'll engage with it or I won't. And SDT felt like something that would work for that and um, that would allow me to, um, to explore it that way. Um, and I think, you know, what the, the learners that I work with are probably quite different to most of the learners that most researchers work with um you know if you're learning English you're probably learning it for a different reason to an Anglophone learning foreign language um you you know adolescent learners are you know generally different to adult learners or undergraduate learners um you know and really for most of them or certainly the ones that I had taught um you know and that was partly geography it was partly where I was teaching but um they just weren't thinking of themselves using this language. It really was about the kind of activities that we were asking them to do. So, you know, this definitely felt like the right the right way to go. Um, now, I just wanted to kind of divert slightly into SDT in schools because it is finding its way a little bit into schools in England. Now, I don't know how much you might know about education there, and I don't know how it relates to school education here, um, but there's been a move to more what they think of as traditional um, or traditionalist kind of education in the last few years, more everything being stricter and what they call direct instruction. You know, no, I don't know if you've come across the limb of in the US is teach like a champion approach of everything, you know, really kind of strict. And that's that's the kind of trend and a couple of um we call them academy chains or trusts um have picked up on this and there, there are organizations that run groups of schools um, and they've kind of discovered sdt and they've turned it into posters which is marvelous so these um exist in some schools you know and they're on all classroom walls in in certain schools and um I don't know how well you can see them. It doesn't say it's SDT, but you know that's what it is. It's the kind of continuum of motivation turned into something a bit weird. So they're kind of saying, okay, um, like the bottom one on the on the purple thing, it says, I want to avoid appearing on the consequences board. So like getting your name written down because you've done something wrong, getting a detention, being in the reflection room, which is a kind of 1984 situation where you get put in a little puppy hole to think about what you've done um, and I want to avoid being caught doing wrong um, or maybe you want to get praised for doing the right thing you want adults to think positive of you you want to have a great future and it's who I am so you can see that kind of internalization but you know they've not really kind of thought about you know they're seeing it as steps so maybe you start off down here and you're a bad kid but you you know, you think of it more and then you decide you like praise more than you like punishment and you like move up. And, you know, that that's the that's what it's turned into at the moment in in schools, um, which. It's like I say, marvellous, but we've got this. Um, but I just thought, I'd, you know, kind of uh, show you those as a little aside. Um, OK, so in terms of what I do i use the self-regulation questionnaire academic i know some of you are more sdt than others in here but i'm kind of assuming everyone is familiar with this stuff um but that doesn't have a motivation in, so I, I add some of those items um i sometimes use the basic needs stuff or the learning climate questionnaire um and then i think about various contextual things but i don't like the basic needs items for schools. I don't know if 
how you guys feel and this might be something interesting to come back to um but i don't feel like these work very well in a school context because school kids don't have a free choice of what they can do they, they're told what to do um, maybe that you know maybe the teacher supports some kind of choices somehow but it's school um yeah people i like that you know the relationships ones relatedness ones kind of you know work a bit better maybe but the you know the real issue i have was with, with the autonomy ones i don't think i don't feel like the way they're characterized here really works but i haven't done anything about that i haven't come up with like you know the abigail parish amazing autonomy scale or anything um but you know maybe i will <laughs> or maybe i won't um, so yeah it might be interesting to come back to that um, but I do, I do use them, but kind of in a kind of half, half-hearted way, really. Um, so I'm going to show you a few different bits of the kind of uh, stuff I've been finding in different studies. And I thought I'd show you what winter looks like as well. It doesn't look like that slightly. Um, so one of the things I did. This is from my PhD, but it still hasn't found its way into the world it's in this kind of you know I have written it up as a paper but it's in some kind of review limbo um so I, I asked them about their favorite subject which in case any of you are working with young people or maybe thinking about working with young people this was really taught me something because I did this fantasy poetry expression there where you know one response was piped into another and the first thing I asked them was, what's your favourite subject? And then that subject was going to be piped into the question. But because teenagers are teenagers, quite a lot of them wrote things like sleeping or Minecraft or something like that. And then it turned into the next question. It said, you know, why do you, why do, you do your work in sleeping? And they all got really embarrassed <laughs> about what they did. Um, but anyway, um, so, you know, essentially what I found here was that they're, favourite subjects, which was very rarely uh, languages, um, they were, you know, they, they had, you know, kind of general higher motivation, autonomous and controlled motivation, the scores were higher um, in the favourite subject, which, you know, I don't think is like some revolutionary finding or anything, but, you know, it was interesting um, to see that. Um, so, you know, there, there's, you know, we know as teachers in this context that, you know, I mean, I, I at one point I taught the same kids languages and history and the exact same class, not, you know, completely everybody the same. And they were different kids in there. They just behaved totally differently in history because they felt like they understood what what was going on. And, I, you know, I, at that time. It was the kind of trend to give an activity as you walked in the door that you would get on with while everyone was settled down. And I used to use these puzzles and it was the same kind of puzzle with like key vocabulary in history and in French. And the history ones, they'd be desperate to do them. They wouldn't even take their coats off. They'd be doing the puzzles. And in French, they'd just get turned into like paper airplanes and stuff. They're just same kid, same teacher, totally different. And, you know, I was interested in that, that kind of stuff. Um, that was I haven't done anything with that since so this was only PhD work it, it you know I haven't kind of pursued it and I didn't get um you know I didn't have a massive sample in, in this part but that's something I've been looking at and I might come back to um in terms of you know kind of trying to understand a bit about why there, there might be a problem with languages I think some of it you know going back to the policy side of things is about what we teach in that subject and how we teach it. So things that basically that the, the kids don't feel is for them. You know, they don't they don't see relevance. And of course, yeah, some of them are not going to see relevance in you know lots of subjects. But it, you know, and it's it's not just me saying this. There's a sense that, that you know the the curriculum is kind of wrong. Um, and you know, the other thing the problem we have with languages as a school subject is the the focus on accuracy which isn't how it is in real life if you're communicating in another language um you know it doesn't 
necessarily need to be super accurate. It needs to be comprehensible. And that, you know, that's not how school can work. So, you know, there's there's lots of kind of curriculum problems, but that partly is why a non-language motivation framework works better. And we also have this kind of issue with um harsh grading. Um, this is from we have this organization called Education Data Lab that produces these um you know various uh, analyses of educational data and essentially you know it's German at the top then there's computing French Spanish um and, you know and those are the most harshly graded subjects so the you know the same kid will get substantially lower grades um down at the bottom is art and design and also something called food preparation uh, <laughs> down there. so if you want you know an easy grade food preparation is way forward um so that's part of the problem as well and the kids know that so in terms of thinking about choice um if they're kind of easy you know they're not desperate to learn a particular language why would you pick them on where you're going to get the, the lower grade um we also have this issue related to it being you know compulsory and optional i know that happens here as well um so obviously there's a kind of a status issue um if that's something you desperately want to learn about, um, there's a, there was a little discussion kind of around the time it was made um, optional uh, in a few papers that is quite an interesting way into thinking about it. So choice. Um, why is that? There? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let's ignore that one. I don't know where that came from. Um, choice. So you know we well we saw in there i don't you know that's a similar but different version but you can see that you know the the trajectory that students are not choosing it but in terms of the grades um the ones who are choosing it are generally getting better grades so grades have gone up um over that time uh it's so i've said here it's grade c or four and above they, they changed from letter grades to number grades um, a few years ago. So they've generally been on this upward trajectory. You can see at the end there's like a COVID thing. I don't know what happened here, but they did um, teacher assessed grades rather than exams. And weirdly, the teachers were quite generous. <laughs> so every subject has this kind of weird bump around them. Um, but you can see it seems to be reverting to where it was. Um, so, you know, a nice you know the, the, like uh an implication of that that aligns nicely with sdt is that you know the, to choose it they're choosing it autonomously and they're then getting you know better outcomes which is what we would expect although that's you know correlation causation by the natural data and um, yes yeah, so that's a covid effect and you yeah, know point one they won't be and um, so again this is phd uh data um so at that time which was when uh there was a kind of bump in that graph um i asked them did you have a choice and i gave four response options now i'm not you know with kind of hindsight i'm not very happy with these but these are what i what i asked I, what i gave them so yes it was up to me um no everyone in my school takes a language so basically free choice or it was compulsory and then I, I can't even really remember why I split it up like this, but I had this, um, I had a choice that I felt under pressure, which I think I was trying to get at things like my parents made me, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I, you know, there was a sense that I should do it. And then a similar but different item about my grades. And that one is the kind of one that's linked to policy and linked to that issue in the graph. So here. So you can see that suddenly more kids were taking it and that's to do with this policy called the English Baccalaureate okay so I don't know if you've heard of it probably not um a baccalaureate you know like in France for example like a collection of subjects that you that you take a, a school leaving certificate and the government uh had this idea of what it meant to be educated and what subjects you know you really should know to be educated and they decided to put this together um into this baccalaureate which was five 
GCSEs that you have to take to, to get it. Um, and I've said, is it a response to the crisis, meaning that kind of declining trend? Um, probably not is the answer to that. Um, but they, yeah, so they're interested in these five subjects. Originally, it was going to be a certificate that students got. In the end, it didn't become that. It just became a way of measuring schools, like a performance measure. Um, and the government said these are subjects that are essential to many degrees, open a lot of doors. It's kind of instrumental uh, reason. And um, it's ideological. There's no kind of two ways about it. The government was like, these are the, the things that are important. Um, this is what it means to be educated. This is what, what you should be doing. And this is what it looks like. So um, English literature and English language and maths and some kind of science thing going on in there. And then a language and humanities subject. Um, and you can see there's this, well, I think it's 19 languages are available, but there's only three that really any school teaches. But if you happen to be a native speaker of one of those languages, you could get put in for the exam and get that qualification uh, without studying for it or, you know, the school having to provide actual teaching. So that, that was quite nice. So um, languages were prioritised in that, but, you know, we saw somewhere um, there was a bit of an upturn, but not loads. Um, and yeah, it was kind of good for languages in, in that they became a bit higher status. But there's still this harsh grading thing and all of that going on that means that it didn't really quite work out how it should. And in fact, the government had this ambition, um, ambition rather than target, that 75% of students would take all of those subjects by 2022, 90% by 2025, and it's got stuck at 40%. It's like it's not going anywhere. It's been that for three years. Um, anyway, that was why I asked the questions the way I did, because schools at that time were streaming pupils onto this EBAC route. If they thought they were likely to pass all those, they were streaming them. And it meant that students who didn't want to take a language were being made to because the school wanted like the numbers. Um, so that was why this uh, grades group was there. Um, yeah, so it's you know, kind of an EBAC pathway. So this is how it split up in terms of who'd had a choice. And essentially, you know, these were uh, the, the types of motivation, types of regulation that were significantly higher on those groups. So, the ones who had the free choice were definitely more autonomously regulated than the others. It was quite interesting to find that in schools where everyone had to take a language, there was higher intrinsic motivation, which I think is to do with like the status of the language in those schools. The fact that it had always been compulsory, the students had joined the school knowing that, they knew they had to do it. Maybe parents had even chosen the school for that reason. Um, and it was perhaps taught in a different way you know, that, that's my kind of punch about that. And then the ones on that EBAC pathway were more externally regulated. And that weird pressure, like option, you know, I felt under pressure that was, you know, a kind of with hindsight a mistake, that one didn't really uh, tell me anything in here. So that's why I did that. Um, and, you know, I tend to be, this is partly why I said I'm not going to get into too much stats I'm, I you know I tend to do more group comparison stuff right you know I'm not a, a big modeler I'm not looking for what predicts what or I haven't been I've been looking at just what's different between my different groups of students rightly or wrongly um I've also got uh this little table which I pulled from from one of the papers with a bit more of the Kind of stats in that's that that's the same data but i'm not going to dwell on it um more recently i've done some stuff kind of looking at over time but it was a cross section so it was a, a one shot um questionnaire but with students in different year groups and um, and um what we found there was that the in the key stage three so the beginning of the first three years of secondary school um they started off fairly autonomously motivated and that declined each year um, and then there was a difference 
you know, quite a strong difference between those who uh, chose the subject and those who didn't. So this, again, is from the paper. It's just come out this month uh, with Kim Mills. So you can see the kind of pattern of that autonomous regulation that, it, that it's declined as time goes on. And teachers will always tell me that year nine is like the worst year group in general. That's, you know, really tricky because they know in most, well, in all schools, they know they're going to get to make some kind of choices in that year for the next year. And in most, they know they're going to get to choose what not to take a language. So, you know, motivation there is, is really tricky and engagement and what have you. Um, so, yeah, there was a real difference um, between those who chose it and those who didn't, but we saw there as well. Um, the last little bit of kind of group comparison stuff I've done is about multilingualism. So this is the most recent out of all this data. Um, and I worked with some colleagues from the University of Lincoln and we used various um, bits and pieces, but we also used a questionnaire about multilingualism. So it's just come out of Norway. Um, and we asked uh, students through the, you know, key stage three and four, so, you know, the early part of secondary school. Um, and we asked them, you know, all these different things, but one of them was about, are you multilingual? And we were surprised actually to find how many said they were uh, because of the area we were working in. It was more than we expected, but there were quite a lot who said they weren't sure, which we think also suggests that they're not, and they didn't really know what, you know, what, what it meant. But what we found in that was that the ones who said they were multilingual were more, essentially more motivated, let's put it like that. They, you know, they had higher um, uh, autonomous motivation uh, scores and lower A motivation scores, and also various different bits and pieces uh, in there about kind of basic needs, but like I said, I don't like to, like not quite happy with the questionnaire, um, and some multilingual stuff, multilingualism stuff from the other questionnaire. Um, so, you know, multilingualism or feeling or considering yourself multilingual was having this really positive impact, which is great, but, you know, you would assume not everyone can be multilingual and that might be nice, but we can't do anything with it. We can't necessarily take it to teachers and say, you know, here's a, here's a, here's a way forward. But actually, we found that when we asked the students, why do you think you're multilingual? They had a whole range of different answers, um, which were quite kind of uh, low level, if you like, not necessarily what, you know, uh, certainly what researchers would think of as multilingual, but just, you know, lay people, adults, we wouldn't necessarily characterise it this way. Um, so counting and greeting people, um, doing karate, apparently makes you multilingual, um, kind of knowing Spanish, um, but then we did have some who were probably, you know, by most definitions, multilingual. And, um, you know, Polish is a very common, um, uh, well, a very common common language, you know, the, the um, you know, a lot of our, I'm trying to think how to phrase it, you know, a lot of our kind of immigrants, if you like, are from Eastern Europe. So that, you know, it's very common. It's certainly in the, in the area that we're working in. Um, uh, I know English and Turkish, I can link them together to be more understandable. Um, and I feel a connection, partake with multiple cultures, you know, some kind of fairly um, standard things in there, but also this other stuff that was really about what they were learning. So, and, uh, you know, same as, you know, your basic needs kind of things, this is about perceptions, it turns out. So when they perceive themselves as multilingual, that had the positive impact, whether or not we might think they were, you know, same as, you know, the competence, for example, you don't have to actually be good at something, you just have to feel competent and it, and it has that impact. So that was actually, you know, it turned out really nice because like, so it feels like something that teachers can potentially use in that. Um, so essentially, you know, there's lots of things going on in, in my context that affect student motivation. Um, and you know, it kind of aligns with what, what we would expect, but there's all sorts of bits and pieces that go together. Um, and, you know, what we kind of know about OCT suggests, you know, just but kind of all makes sense. And, you know, and I feel quite um, uh, vindicated in having 
used SDT as a framework now, I feel like it's opened more doors to me than, than sticking with a language focused one. And like I said, I'm definitely in the cult. Um, you know, whether whether people are on board with that or not, I, you know, from what I understand here, there's like the different camps and maybe maybe I can't be friends with some new friends in the cult, who knows? <laughs> um, I do have, I had those kind of, um, you know, uh, student quotes at the beginning that were maybe a bit, uh, well, they weren't exactly depressing, but they weren't great. Um, but there are some nice things going on. So, you know, sometimes uh, people say to me, is there nothing good to say about languages? Um, but there is, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of um, students who are interested in in language learning, but not necessarily school language learning. And I think there's there's more to do to unpick that for sure. Um, so students saying, you know, these languages are really cool, they're different. Um, there's a lot of links to travel, people, you know, wanting to learn something because they want to travel there. Um, this one, because I'm an old person, it took me a while to understand what J-Rock was, it was Japanese rock music. Um, but that was something that, you know, this, this student said they wanted to do. Um, and also apparently multilingualism means you're really cool. Mm -hmm. And that little face, they put that, I didn't know that. Um, so there's some good news, I think, in there. But, and, you know, but there's, yeah, some kind of tricky stuff as well. Um, that's it for me. Yeah. Very happy for questions. Don't get picky about numbers. Let's talk concepts. <laughs> questions are on the floor. So first of all, sorry if I arrived too late. So maybe my question is irrelevant. Can you go back to the table uh, with the different types of motivation? <clears throat> I saw there were some correlations on the right and some medians. On the left. Are you going to ask me about numbers? Yes, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> My question is relevant. <laughs> um, so, oh, uh, yeah. Not that one? It's, it's further back. Yeah. Further back, okay. Um, <clears throat> I was in the stall. That, no, I think further it was back. before yeah, that. That one, yeah, that, that, one. that one. Yeah, okay. Two, um, two questions. So first, can you repeat to me what these correlations are just are like? You're correlating the types of motivation with an outcome, or no? This, this, it's not correlations. It's um, group differences. Um, so it's uh, looking at um, um, motivation scores. So on on the the different. Um, motivation subscales to do with um it, like in your favorite subjects and in languages um, that makes sense yeah i just yeah. thought that like, the right column is, is a little hard so i thought these that's the effect size three. i think oh, okay yeah that's the effect size. <laughs> okay uh that may be my second so thank you and uh my second question i uh couldn't make sense why the median controlled and autonomous was that high uh while like identified and implicit motivation or like three point five and four. Sorry, say that again. So um so I see for instance the median of intrinsic and identified motivation is three point five and four. And then in the row below that one, the autonomous motivation refers to seven as a median. <clears throat> I just couldn't make sense why this was a case as autonomous is like a combination of identified and intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Um I don't know. Yeah. It, look, it does look like a mistake, doesn't it? Like, I, yeah. It's like, and that's the same. Yeah, it does look like. Oh, yeah. 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 Maybe I've done it. I mean, it might be a mistake. Okay. Um, that's fine. But it's good they pointed out. No. <laughs> so I can check okay. it. Yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, I haven't got an answer for you, but I'm grateful for you to have like it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I suspect that your autonomous is more a measure of. Uh, uh, I chose it because I liked it or something like that. And because uh, they were looking at their favorite subject, it's almost by definition, they'd give it a very high score. But that wasn't my question. My question was, uh, you said something about you thought the STT continuum was dubious for language learning. And did you uh, have... 
no, not the continuum. I was, I, uh, what did I say? I said it wasn't convinced with basic needs in the classroom. Did I say something about the continuum? Yeah, like the Why wouldn't yeah. basic needs be relevant in the classroom? It's not that, uh, no, yeah, it's, I didn't mean to say they're not relevant. I meant, what I meant was that the items that, you know, that I've um, put up here, from, you know, from the, um, from that scale don't seem to capture, I, I don't feel, and I'm very willing to, to discuss that they, ca that they capture the classroom experience all that well, because yes, it's perceptions of autonomy, but the, the way school works and the structure of school is that there's very limited scope for autonomy. And yeah. when I think about that concept, I just don't feel comfortable with them. Okay, well, I mean? I'd, I'd be really interested in hearing John Marshall uh, uh, perspective on that, because I think the work that he and I are, are doing would suggest that uh, is quite relevant. Yeah, I'm very happy, like genuinely very happy to do have discussion about that. Thank you. Yeah. Great comment. I think it's extremely relevant. It's uh -huh. just uh, very, very low levels. Yeah. Uh, well, my question is it looks really bleak in these uh, <laughs> second language uh, motivation courses. Yeah. And how do you square this? Uh, the, the adolescents, the secondary school students I know, are just uh, incredibly excited about Duolingo. Mm. I've got 80 days in a row and 81 and then yeah. learning Japanese or whatever it is. How can you square this up? If my antidote is right, mm. I see all so many kids who just love do, doing the language, learning the language, mm -hmm. just the language. Just yeah, Duolingo, and they get in these these stats that they get in class, and they just turn. Yeah, it off. yeah. Do do you know in those kind of anecdotes what what languages they're learning? Are they ones they do they in school? The language. There's yeah, like eighty languages. Yeah, but it, you know, I I think you know, kind of speculating really but i think that you know in our concept at least the thing is that they there is very little choice so in most schools you know one or two languages are taught and usually they get allocated so they don't get to choose which language usually and there aren't the certainly to british kids the asian languages are more like exotic and exciting and they like the culture part of that so they tend you know lots of them have a an interest in learning Japanese particularly, but it's not taught in school. So I guess maybe that's part of that, that, you know, it's that way they can learn the one they're interested in and in school they're stuck with the one they're given. And also, I mean, I, I you know, I can't, you know, compared to the Australian one, I don't know, but some of what we teach is like, it's not interesting in the slightest. I used to, my- What do these classes look like if I'm going to preach class? Yeah. Just miserable. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, to, to be honest, kind of. It's hard work. Like the, the, as you know, the teacher has to work very hard to get anything out for kids. They don't want to speak. Um, they, 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 you know, you in. I mean, you know, of course, not all of are the same. But you know, you, you, it's quite difficult to convince the kids they know anything and that they. You know that they can apply what they learnt in one context to another context, and yes, they've learnt how to say they like something, but they learnt how to say they like a particular sport, and so how will they say that they like a particular food? That's just impossible to make that connection somehow. And that, you know, so it, it it always the teacher always feels like very hard work, and the, and the kids because they partly I think because it's either right or wrong there's no oh yeah that's that's good enough like there might be if you were having a comp you know if you traveled abroad and tried something and you you were like mainly understood that would be okay and you would get what you asked for or whatever but it doesn't work like that it's like it's either right or it's wrong and more often than not it's wrong and then you know that kind of competence you know it's competence frustration all the way um so you know that yeah there's you know the teachers are doing the best they can in, in the environment they're in, but the environment is just really not a, a good one. It's it's not a great place, you know, great kind of uh, system for, for actually learning a language in. And so I think, you know, when students can, yeah, pick up their phone and, and do it 
in their own time you know there's it's more appealing and th there's yeah you know there's lots of things that are kind of just a little bit wrong and they're all come together to make yeah it can be I mean, it can feel pretty bleak I think but it's not that the kids aren't interested it's that the lessons and the curriculum and what have you just doesn't you know they just don't support it really it's just some comments there from Jenny um okay so so Jenny did you want to say anything sorry I didn't mean to put you on the spot but Hi. You're on mute. Um, I'm not in a quiet environment. I'm actually on annual leave. But I will say, um, if anyone wants to question the comment, it's basically just um, a bit of context for Australia. If mm. the children, if, if you do um, language in your final VCE, Victorian Curriculum um, Examinations, you, it, you it's weighted more highly and so... Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, it's reflected in their ATAR. That's interesting. interesting. That is interesting. I mean, I, you know, I'm not while you're on annual leave, but I would like to know more about this kind of stuff. So, you know, like anyone who's got insight into that, you know, very happy to, to talk and, you know, at something, but not while you're on annual leave. <laughs> no, 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 sure. I'll be back on um, the 1st of July. I'm just um, up north in my brother's house and there's animals and things running around. So I'll just stay on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. I also understood, and I may be very wrong because I didn't grow up in Australia, so some of you Australians correct me, but um, I understood that language studies in Australia are also kind of language and culture studies, where you learn a lot about the culture, and do some very cultural things in addition to learning the language. Mm -hmm. Did someone kind of back me up on there, whether that's correct or wrong? I'm here yeah, yeah. yeah. and studying yeah. skills. I don't yeah. know to what extent that's true of the curriculum, as much as well as teachers how they treat into the trust. Yeah. Teachers who are teaching Japanese Japanese, who translate from the first to the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's a good thing. It's just something that teachers need to do. But I can imagine it would provide a really much more fun environment mm -hmm. to teach languages then. Yeah, you mind my school to teach kids to you. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. And we were public, not Yeah, yeah. But if you talk Japanese in your language, you can't even choose to reach to produce a culture. That used to happen a lot more in the UK. And one way or another, you know, partly the curriculum's become more crowded, partly that kind of moved to the like traditional, you know, pseudo traditional style of education has crowded that out. Believe it or not, some schools or some academy trusts um, say that you can't have displays in the classroom anymore because they're distracting. They've got very hung up on cognitive load theory and they reckon that displays distract you from whatever it is you should be doing. So that, you know, and that's why language teachers used to do all that cultural stuff. My mum was a French teacher and I can't tell you how many times I've stood you know, watching her pull posters off the wall or like, you know, that kind of thing. So she could then put them on her classroom uh, displays and they, they can't have that anymore. And, you know, so we used to do that quite well. And, and now, you know, it, it happens much less. And I think that probably does have an impact. Um, yeah. Yeah. There we go. So did you mention that the students can choose the language they want to learn each year? If, if that's the case, uh, I think uh, it has a lot to do with the, the language teacher. Just if I don't yeah. like this teacher, I change it to another one next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if not, like, if they have to choose the language um, before they get to know the teacher or yeah. get to experience the, the language learning, uh -huh. and how, how can we make sure, uh, or how can we affect their choice uh, when they have no knowledge or no experience of that language? Because it's it's completely based on like nothing, or their, yeah. their prior knowledge of yeah. language. So usually they don't get a choice of which language, even at the beginning. Usually it's allocated. Either there's only one on offer at all, or it's split. You know, when I was at school, it was split by surname. So the first half of the alphabet did one, and there's, you know, just like, like you know, not random, but basically random like that. Um, you know, so the, the students often don't have a choice. If 
they happen to have done two at the beginning of secondary school, which is very rare now, then they could choose which one to continue usually, but that it, it happens very rarely. Um, they usually, well, these days they have done some kind of language at primary school, but it might not be something that's on offer in the secondary school. And even if it is, they probably haven't learnt very much in the primary school because there are rarely specialist teachers. So often it's just, you know, any, any primary school teacher who's trained in all the different subjects, but rarely trained in anything to do with the language. So they're then just told, here's some, you know, kind of here's a list of 10 animals, go and teach them to the kids. And that's about the size of it. And when they've done the animals, they might do colours. Then they might do numbers when they go back to animals. Um, so they, you know, they don't tend to have much to go on. So you're right, like they don't, if if they are able to make a choice before they start, which is very, very rare, they don't, they're not really, they don't really know what they're kind of letting themselves in for, if you like. And because French and Spanish are now so much more common than German, and because they're in the same language family, some, you know, sometimes, those suit people and sometimes they don't and you know there isn't usually something else that that you could try um there's, there's lots of kind of curricular problems that you know that we've kind of led us to where we are and i think i think the the overarching thing is that just that people as in kind of wider wider society and the government they just don't really care about very much they're not actually interested in whether people have language skills or not because those guys also think, well, everyone speaks English, why bother? So, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so there are um, some students who mm. express, uh, I don't know why I have to learn second language, mm. as you mm. mentioned at the beginning of the yeah. uh, presentation. And I, I and there are all the uh, regions that are very understandable that I don't, mm. uh, I will not have any trouble. I'm interested in uh, learning in other languages. Mm. Uh, then do you think that uh, is it important to learn second language for that kind of students? Uh, or if so, then can you provide any good uh, rationale for them? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it is really tricky to do that, really, because much as as a language teacher and someone interested in languages, you want to say everyone should learn something opens, not necessarily opens like instrumental doors to like new jobs or job opportunities, but just like windows on the world. So, like you, you just see things differently or you experience things differently. So you want to feel like, yes, everyone should do that. But if, it, if it's going to be barrier after barrier for the student, is that the right thing to do? Uh, you know, I, I would be reluctant to say, no, some people don't have to or shouldn't learn a language. But really, if you take individuals, perhaps there are some for whom there's something more useful for them that they could be doing. But tricky and yeah. you know in terms of what you say to the student you know certainly when they have to do it and you know they're in year eight or whatever and they've got to keep going with it you know you you, you end up you know you you cut your you, you just have to kind of shut down the conversation more than anything else because anything you try doesn't well in, in some circumstances it doesn't work the, the kids that i used to teach you know they were from this town grimsby some of them <laughs> genuinely had never left that town and it's not a big town and it has not got a lot to do <laughs> you know, but they hadn't left it they didn't see themselves ever leaving their parents were like third generation unemployed it it was you know it's really hard to say to those kids one day you might travel you might work for this global company I, I used to sometimes say to them well you never know who your neighbours might be or you never know who you might fall in love with and they were like <laughs> whatever <laughs> it didn't work <laughs> so you kind of have to fall back on well it's school and we've got to do it yeah. which is not right <laughs> any last questions yeah so this is all really interesting the thing i'm sort of wondering about is like, what do we do with this information yeah and so like if i was to make you 
Minister for Education. I was like, ah, it's all on the clock, so we can do whatever you want. What would you do? What would be the policy yeah. change in the, the way they, they took that language? Yeah, I think I think it is about what how it's taught and understanding that you know, it, like when when you travel, if you go, let's say we all went to Finland, where probably nobody speaks Finnish, and and any language you already speak probably doesn't help you because Finnish is so weird. You would still find, you know, you'd get on the bus and the bus driver would be able to speak English. You'd um, you know, you'd speak to the cleaner in your hotel and they'd be able to speak English. And, you know, you know, so even people who are in quite low paid, you know, arguably low skilled jobs have language skills because actually in most of the world, language skills are not that remarkable and they're not like impossible to learn. We, you know, all of us use language all the time, whatever language it is. And I don't think school recognises that that this is not doesn't have to be some like impossible task and and you know where I showed you the eback and that that big table you know it's in there with these academic subjects because you know they're kind of valuing it as something that shows you're a really good learner and I think it's that that we need to kind of let go of and you know if we could let go of the idea that it has to be perfect and it has to be like systematic and it has to you know show something about about you that you you know, you're able to kind of meet these challenges. If we can let go of that, we can turn it into the fun stuff like the, like you get from Duolingo. And the kids saying, well, I, I do karate so I can, you know, get these Japanese words. And we can, we can kind of focus on that stuff and hopefully, you know, get the interest there. So I think if, you know, if, yeah, if I were king for a day, as it were, that, that would be the kind of thing I'd want to, to shift is, is the, the focus on, academic learning and kind of accuracy perfection I think that's probably where to start but it's not going to happen thanks very much all right one more round of applause for Abigail thank you for those online thanks sir thanks to Mac